Welcome to the Rise of the Challenge podcast. Join me today. He's the co-founder of the Alosha app and software engineer. It's Tariq. How are you doing today, Tariq? I am doing good. It's, it was a very pleasant but hot Sunday, but it was a good day all in all. It's good. <laughs> I can totally agree with that here where I'm at. We're excited to have you on the show to talk about your rise to the challenge. What we like to do first is go right to the beginning. Talk about where you're from and what were you involved in growing up? Oh, so um, I'm from Richmond, Virginia. Um, you know, I grew up there, was born there. Um, while growing up, my mother always put me in extracurricular activities, um, being involved in the community, with community service and things like that. As I started to get older, um, I kind of started leaning a little bit more toward, you know, science, technology, engineering. Um, and then slowly but surely, I eventually kind of, you know, decided, yeah, I'll probably go to school and get a degree in computer engineering. Um, you know, I did a lot of athletics as well in school, but that was because, you know, I had, a, had a lot of energy, like most kids, you know, I had yeah. to go do something with it. <laughs> so, you know, and, and, um, that's that's kind of my story it's you know it's straightforward I think what got you so interested in computers and softwares and stuff like that growing up because a lot of times with kids it's kind of like well nowadays they're all with their phones they all are technology savvy but what made it for you interesting well I really enjoyed it because um a lot of what I do now what I kind of been was, would get into as a kid it's like a puzzle you know, I, I like problem solving, you know, I like to kind of work through a, a, a particular uh, math problem and solve it. And it's just such a satisfying feeling when all the pieces kind of just fit into each other and you get a solution out of it. Yeah. Um, you know, oftentimes um, with the arts in general, it's a little bit more abstract and in the other direction, but I've always kind of leaned a little bit more toward the concrete on the math and sciences side. Um, you know, and so I guess with Alosha, you know, me and my other co-founder, Mark, we kind of complete each other in that department. <laughs> As you're getting older, was there anything that you got inspired by? Was there a person that was in that kind of industry that was helping you follow that passion that you enjoy doing with software and computers? Um, not a, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as, as in my case, you know, growing up as a kid, um, I, my father, he passed at a, you know, when I was a, on the younger end of the spectrum. Um, and he had also was, even though, you know, this was a 90s, so it's not nothing like today, but he was still into computing and things like that. And consequently, uh, a lot of my brothers actually went into um, software engineering um, as well, or some type of related to software engineering in some way. Um, and so as I got older, I, I will say you begin to learn more about your father. You get to learn more about your extended family. And I, I think oftentimes you kind of get the feel that, you know, say, yeah, this stuff's complicated, but I have a little bit of a legacy for this, you know? Like, if, you know, I, if my dad was able to do it, my brother's into this type of stuff, it's tricky, but, you know, I, I've got about half of what they got going for them. So why can't I? You know, and so when you start to kind of get a feel, see, it's, it's kind of sometimes hard to to kind of create the legacy. But if you're someone like me and you're just trying to live up to it, it kind of just falls into place sometimes. And um, that's what kind of led me a, a lot toward, you know, kind of persevering through this whole track of uh, doing software engineering. Was this something that you and your brothers could bond over, something that got you together to talk about, or was the relationship with your brothers perfectly fine at the time, but this you just made it even better? Yeah, really, this just makes it even better, um, especially now during my older years, you know, we're able to kind of go into business with each other mm -hmm. and help each out each other with different services and things like that. So it, it definitely fits like a glove. When it's younger, it's really more of just looking up to people you know, and aspiring to, you know, to be like them, you know, um, and, you know, I'm having this conversation now with you, I, I guess I never quite realized how much of a, um, an influence just, you know, because my family, my brothers, you know, my father, you know, they, they never pushed me toward these types of things. But when you kind of think about it, you know, just knowing that they were in that field definitely had a big hand in me being, you know, where I am today. 
<laughs> what would you say to kids get now trying to get involved with computers and science and stuff like that? Was it in your time, was it hard for kids to even get into it because the technology wasn't there? There wasn't much opportunities at all? Um, yeah, I mean, it all kind of starts, at least I think with me, a lot of the computing stuff kind of really started with um, getting into those uh, like Legos robotics competitions and stuff during my younger years. Um, you know, and that's, that's the big thing. Um, there is a little bit of a barrier because some of those Lego competitions or to get into the math and science center um, that's in your area, you know, those courses are expensive. Yeah, um, yeah. So there is that barrier right there and having to, you know, pay those bills and things like that. But, um, you know, I've been very fortunate that, you know, I have a parents, uh, you know, um, that were really supportive of me, you know, wanting to do those types of things. And they were able to make the sacrifices to put me in position. You talked about the Legos and kind of, there was something when I was growing up, we have something here called the Science Center. And there was a part where you had to take this robot and you had to compute it and you had to tell what directions it needed to go to follow this path to, to complete this mission. And I thought this was the coolest thing. And this was maybe 10 years, 15 years ago. And now just looking at everything that has been happening now, and it's just crazy, the changes and robotics and stuff like that. It's just, I wish I was now getting involved in that because it's just so cool looking because when I was younger, it's just the start of everything. And now as you're seeing the evolution, what are you shocked at seeing right now? Yeah, I was actually recently shocked um, not too long ago. Like, so I have... Um... I have, I have two sons and I have a daughter on the way. And um, my two sons, they're four and six. And recently their aunt and my, my sister had brought them um, these toy helicopters. Now, when I was a kid and you got a toy helicopter, maybe lights would come on, the propellers would spin. And, and that would be about it. Now, my two kids are four and six years old. Their toy helicopter actually can like levitate off the ground and fly around and with, with a remote controller and everything. Yeah. And it's like, you know, and it's dirt cheap to get that type of technology. That blew my mind when, when I saw what those things could do. I was like, wow, this is so cool. You know, I'd be feeling bad for the kids. I play with them a little bit more than them, but you know, we all have a good time together. <laughs> As you're getting older, what was that dream job that you were wanting? Um, you know, I, 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 I never quite had a, a dream job, you know, sometimes I know oftentimes amongst the, uh, the, the, the success circles and, and things of that nature, you know, you're supposed to have a grand vision um, of like who you want to be and everything like that. But I, I definitely didn't have that during my younger years, probably before even the age of potentially even 20 or 21 or something uh, about where I wanted to be. Um, but as I got into my, my twenties and everything, um, cause I got married at a pretty young age. I was about I think 20, I was 20, I was 20 when I actually, I got married. Um, and, uh, we, we coming up on our eighth or eight year, we're coming up on our eighth year anniversary actually in about a week or so. Um, and, um, and, and one of the things that kind of evolved evolved during this particular, you know, being in college, working part-time, trying to get a degree in computer engineering, kind of scraping during those years, those college years to make ends meet was, you know, I worked so hard to get a job when I graduated and I got one. And then I got there and after everyone told me what I was supposed to, to this is what I was supposed to do, I was unhappy. I, I didn't like being there like 40 hours out of the week from nine to five. It was like the best hours of the day. Was, these are going to be the best years of my life, you know, and I have to sit here in front of a computer, you know, fixing bugs and stuff. And so at that point, there were rumbles within myself prior to, you know, that of who I wanted to be. But eventually during that period of, um, you could call, I wasn't wandering in the wilderness, but I'll call it that. We're trying to figure out what's my big life picture, you know, because at that time, you know, I had a, I had a, a yeah, when I got to, when I got to, when I got my job, I had a child and I had a wife 
you know, how to take care of those, those bills and everything, you start to get a feel for, you know what, this, this isn't the nine to five thing ain't for me. Um, you know, and so slowly but surely you begin to get a taste for independence and self-employment and conducting your own business and your own trade and running things according to your terms and only doing things that you're truly interested in. Um, and that's kind of getting me close to where I am now and what I am currently pursuing with, you know, Alosha is just, you know, like anybody, you want to build something and do something that you're passionate about. And it was a long road coming before I really got this to this point and truly internalized that, you know, it's not necessarily one thing that I wanted to do is just, I just wanted freedom and independence. I want to be able to wake up on a Tuesday morning and say, you know what, kids, let's go to the park. Come on, let's go. <laughs> let's go hop in the SUV. You know, um, that's, that's kind of the, the goal, you know, that's, that's it. I think that's why a lot of people look for that entrepreneurial a road because it's so free to create your own schedule, what it looks like. And I think a lot of people don't want to have that restriction of nine to five, but they're trying to go in different avenues, but they're trying to feel it out to see, is this worth the risk and stuff? Something you talked about where you're making ends meet during college. Let's talk about that time. Did you feel that your life was going very quickly during your time in college? Because you talked about you're getting married in college, you had a kid by the time you had your first job. A normal college student isn't going through that, but do you feel that kind of helped you get your mind focused on what was next for your life? Yeah. Um, oh, ab absolutely. Um, you know, when it comes to, you know, my wife, um, uh, my, my first born son, um, Zade, they, they were kind of instrumental. Oftentimes, you know, I, I really like the, the title of this um, podcast because to rise to the challenge is you automatically have to assume or a prerequisite to rising to the challenge is having a challenge, mm -hmm. you know? And so you find yourself, I'm sure you've heard the saying, you know, about, you know, the, the, like some of the most toughest individuals, some of the, the sharpest individuals in history, these guys, these gals as well, they were forged in the crucible of fire, you know, yeah. not that that was my experience. I, I feel like I had a generally good time and I had it easy and I didn't feel like that at the time, but <laughs> looking back, yeah, that, that was a blast and I, I had a good time doing it, you know, um, but uh, but it was definitely, it was part of that, you know, see, I, I don't think I would have been as far as I am today and entrepreneurially, if, you know, I didn't have a wife, if I didn't have, you know, two sons, if I spent, even if I feel like, you know, when I had a, now I have a third on the way, I feel like I, that even caused my, you know, business game to step up a notch even more, you know, it was because of the family expanding. Um, it's those challenges that, that not necessarily make us. And in my particular situation, um, it was definitely just, uh, you know, it's, it's meeting and rising to that challenge. To meet it is, that, that's what makes you, that's what, that's what defines you, it's those moments. Through the experience with making ends meet, did the relationship between you and your wife get stronger because you had to maybe talk more, had to basically plan out things a lot more, or did it kind of go in a different direction and there was kind of some rough roads in the way? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. If anybody, you know, any married person tells you, you know, you know, marriage is filled with highs and lows, but uh, through it all, we, 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 you know, during the early days prior to us getting married, um, you know, we before we got married, we took counseling from some of the elders between our two communities. And, and during that period, um, this kind of goes to the whole rising to the challenge thing. Um, during that period, one of them said, you know, oftentimes when you look at the, the households of leaderships and, and people that are active in their communities and solving problems and stuff, you'll see a lot of discord and, and issues, you know, inside of these households. And, and oftentimes it's because there's an imbalance in the, in his case, in our case, you know, the, the spirituality and the knowledge and the growth between the two 
because you know one of the individuals is basically bumping up against more challenges and you know basically evolving beyond the other and it's that gap there between the two is where the course of most of the problems come from um during the course of a marriage you know yeah um my wife and i were and have been very fortunate that we've evolved at the same rate over the same years you know so while you know, when the challenge is, that's one of the things as well about, you know, rising to the challenge, coming back to that topic again, is um, when you got more than one person, you have to look at each other and, and make sure that you're both rising to meet that challenge at the same time. Otherwise, you're both not going to make it. That was, um, that, that was one of the biggest things. Um, and, but through it all, because we were both evolving at the same time, we grew closer together, you know, and we basically built like a whole reservoir of memories and experiences to draw on that strengthen our marriage for the future going forward. I think you brought up a great point with evolving at the same time, because it shows that is that relationship worth it? Because if that person is able to go through the trenches with you, but you're also at the same time going through the trenches with them, Mm -hmm. it shows the bond in the kind of the, basically the the, the bond you guys have and it's definitely different than with friendships because friendships you're going through it at different times but you're trying to make sure you're sticking with them and I think with relationships it just shows the ones that work are the ones like you said that they evolve at the same time it could yep. be a slow climb it could be a fast climb but it just shows that you guys made it through and you're still going at a great rate right now yeah yeah pretty much um you know, it's, uh, it's, it's been fun. You know, I think sometimes me and my wife, we, we sit around sometimes and you know, we look at each other like, yeah, this has been an adventure. And it really <laughs> still is an adventure, to be honest. <laughs> you know, um, as you know, we try to ramp up toward this next stage. We're trying to expand Alosha. I have some other business ideas I want to try as well. And, you know, and it's always like that, you know, where you get to a comfortable spot, but then you have to meet the challenge, say with the case of Alosha of expanding and basically building a team and managing, you know, that that's anxiety inducing going somewhere you've never been before. Yeah. That You know, I, I know the feeling I'm very familiar with it. And so much of this thing is just meeting the challenge time and time again is like you wake up one morning, you slay the dragon, you go to sleep, you got to wake up, slay another one, you know, and it it's just nonstop. <laughs> Talk about that first job out of college or that first job that you really found a passion for. Oh, okay. Yeah. So my first job out of college, um, that was with Hughes Network Systems. They're a uh, satellite internet provider based out here. I, I live in the DC area now. Um, they're based out in the Maryland Gatesburg, Germantown area. Um, and during that time, I worked like on the embedded modem side, like basically in satellite modems. And you know, I was one of those types of software engineers on the embedded side. And I had a, I really enjoyed my time there. It was a great place to kind of uh, to start my career. And they really tested me first day on the job. They handed me some highly visible, you know, kind of tricky problem that they hadn't quite figured out yet. And that was basically their whole entire product line was in, dependent upon me, some new hire, <laughs> figuring out how to do it. You know, it was entirely experimental with high risk and everything. But they threw it at me. And, you know, fortunately, you know, because I had good managers and I could bounce ideas off of people, I was able to complete it. Um, but slowly but surely during that time, um, you know, I, I it's, yes, you know, you, you're, you're a young couple. You know, thinking of my situation, um, you know, you're married, you have small children, you're not necessarily able to be at home for, you know, for your, for your wife, you know, to help her with these small children. And that, that's causing some friction there, very, very real friction. And so at that point, you start to feel a, a strong desire for your own independence because of the environment that, you know, I, I was in at the time. And so slowly but surely, I start to try different things um, in app development, you know, um, uh, slowly, eventually leading up to, um, you know, Alosha. Um, but it, it really starts way back, like in, not way back, it was only like six years ago, <laughs> 2015, you know, um, back on the job. But um, you, you just get a feel for, 
you know, as bad as it was during college, doing the part-time thing, kind of scrapping to make ends meet, um, trying to get a degree, you felt alive or I felt alive, you know? When I had a job back in 2015 through, what was this, 2018, I think. I think I was there for about three years. You know, I, I didn't I didn't feel very alive, you know? Uh, you know, not like I, I do now. It's very risk involved with self-employment and, you know, pursuing your own, you know, aspirations and things like that. But it's definitely, um, yeah, you, you'll feel alive, but that's for certain. <laughs> Was there anyone that was giving you advice to maybe get out of what you were doing and start that kind of self um, self journey you went on to finally get into app development? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. So um, I, I, I'm fortunate because, you know, I, I have a wife who's always been supportive of the whole entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and so she's, she, she's always understood the risks involved with, you know, being self-employed and you might have to scrape to make ends meet, mm -hmm. you know, um, during 2020, you know, COVID-19 pandemic and stuff like that, the app development business took a dive. Yeah, so yeah. now I'm out there, you know, delivering fast food, doing DoorDash, Uber and all that stuff just to make ends meet. Um, to a lot of people that most, most of the, you know, a lot of women that might make them anxious and nervous, you know, a lot of wives aren't going to necessarily want to be down for that. But um, I've been fortunate to be, you know, have that type of support, you know, in real time, coupled with the fact that, um, uh, you know, I have kind of the whole thinking back to, you know, my father, my brothers, like, okay, yeah, they kind of into the business thing on the, on the software side, they can do it, I can do it too. Um, you know, it's, you know, I've just been very, it's, it's hard to do the independence thing if you don't have the support system around you um the community that i'm a part of up here definitely in, in dc definitely you know values independence and being self-employed um and you know and what comes with it both good and bad you know yep. so I, i've been fortunate to to kind of have that support system I, I know it's you know man you know bless some people's hearts that can actually do the whole self-employment thing if they don't have the support system around them those are the real tough guys. I'm not one. <laughs> Talk about how did Alosha become what it is today? Well, yeah. So it started off um, during the early days when I quit my job back in, uh, I want to say 2018. Um, and uh, I started a basically to contract out my services for app development. And um, I had met Mark using, or Mark had met me via the Stumtech via this web, this app called Thumbtack, you know, people can reach out, you know, and I have created a profile for app development. And, uh, you know, we started off on good terms and, you know, we talked through the program and everything and we basically struck up the contract and we got to work on it. Um, at the end of it, you know, I thought it was a good idea. The whole concept of helping artists, you know, or the up and coming artists, basically sell their art without having to pay a huge commission of some 50% some of these um, some of these uh, art galleries um, and it's to basically do it at a, a fraction of that and you know and, and then just keep it moving and then also they don't have to pay a subscription if we don't get paid till they get paid so um, I thought it was a good idea and so I he brought me on as like a co-founder and uh, we've been working on it um, uh, ever since we've had a few kind of misfires with some of the technology on my side, but you know, it's always a matter of just coming back. You know, you think about, you know, I, I spoke a little bit earlier about, you know, rising to the occasion to slay the dragon day after day in software development. You literally have to do that because day after day, new bugs will pop up and yep. you will have to slay those dragons on a daily basis. And, um, and I think sometimes you have to, you know, this, this thing ain't a sprint. Entrepreneurship, you have a grand business idea. It's, it's a marathon and you will have to, you know, before you kind of even break even, you're going to probably have slain a thousand dragons. But by then, whatever endeavor you take on after that, you have all that experience slaying dragons and stuff. It'd come easy, you know, you move on to bigger, better things. Is it hard or easy to have a co-founder that is in a completely different, like, 
experience level because like you're the part on the software behind the scenes and Mark might be not on that kind of industry level, but on a different side, does that help or does that hurt how you guys have been able to work at this business? Well, yeah. So in, in our given case, it, it helps a lot. Um, the conventional wisdom is when with like startups and our okay, one of a bootstrap startup um, is that you should spend half your time on development, half your time on marketing. So, and um, it, it works out great for us because I don't know anything about marketing and Mark doesn't really know anything about software development. So therefore, by definition, we can't dabble in each other's d- domains. Mm-hmm. We bounce ideas off of each other. Like if he has a new feature in mind that he wants to potentially start, you know, pitching to prospective users of the app, um, I can provide insight on what it's going to take to get it done. And sometimes I have ideas for, you know, different avenues for marketing, you know, and you can come up with the ideas and the methods for, um, for kind of vocalizing and verbalizing the, the messaging. Um, so we, it's, it's, it's easier if you have a diverse group of people from different, you know, professional backgrounds, um, because it at least kind of, it lets you focus on what you should focus on as opposed to what you want to focus on, you know? Correct. And I think, I think a lot of businesses, even now, even if it's not a startup can relate to that because you have so many people with so many different experiences and different backgrounds that you should be able to utilize it. And from a person that doesn't have that experience, they're able to think outside of the box, think as a consumer or someone that's using the product, and then they can bounce those ideas. So I think it shows that you guys have been able to work together with completely different backgrounds. And like, you guys are still keeping going today and still have that good working relationship. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Again, um, you know, it all comes back to being, you know, this this thing is a marathon, you know, yeah. and, you know, and except this is more like one of those three-legged marathons where, you know, you got to get be synced up with your partner for the long term and, and things like that. Um, but I, I think all in all, what really helps with a, a long-term kind of successful business relationship is, the ability for the partners, especially during those early stages to basically be people be able to take breaks, you know, Um, you know, when you're trying to bootstrap a particular business idea or maybe some type of endeavor um, and you're doing it as part of a team collaboration, you you both kind of have to be respectful of each other's uh, vacation time, you know, kind of just take a break and take a breather, you know, take your foot off the gas for maybe a couple months and then get right back in the saddle and hit it hard again, you know? Um, and uh, it's like, it's one of those things. Uh, my wife recently was, uh, she was kind of training for the marathon and she was reading up on it and everything. And she was telling me how the, uh, one of the popular quotes about training for the marathon is that there is no such thing as overtraining. There is only underresting. And I blew my mind and it makes me think of so much about life and and uh, working hard in business and everything. There's no such thing as working too hard on your business ideas. Um, but, you know, there's only such a thing as just not taking enough time off to just relax yeah. and take it easy. When did you guys finally see that this was really taking off? Or are you guys still in that kind of, not the whole sprint thing, but taking it, trying to still get everything going? Yeah, I mean, the app has taken off. Um, so we've got about a thousand users, I think, between the two app stores. Potentially, no, no, no. Think about two thousand technically between the two app stores, and um, it's definitely is taking off um, currently right now. But we we kind of have to get it to the next level, you know, and kind of set some metrics we're going to try to hit and and kind of drive hard to it, um, you know. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's that's. That's really it, yeah. <laughs> is there anything that you're looking forward to with the app or something that maybe people can expect but not give away everything that's going to happen? Oh, yeah, yeah. So we have some pretty cool um, features to try to virtualize a lot of what, you know, art sellers would typically get at the um, at the art gallery, but just making it free of, you know, service to our, you know, app users. And then they can, um, you know, if they make a sale, then, you know, we get paid just as they get paid. 
a little bit different than how they do things at the art galleries, you know. Um, you know, we kind of see ourselves as trying to, to help the, the little guy, you know, which usually doesn't really, historically speaking, doesn't get any help whatsoever. Um, you know, but I mean, that, that's, that's kind of, I don't want to give away too much, but we are, you know, actually, I was just before this meeting here, I was just working on um, some things, you know, on that topic. You got to keep people with a cliffhanger. They got to check it out now and see yeah. what happens. You can't give away all your secrets right now. Of course. Yeah. They have to go to a Losha app on Twitter um, and on Facebook and give us a follow and uh, they'll get the latest news and when these new features roll out. Looking at your journey so far, would you change anything that you've done or you appreciate the path that you've taken because it made you who you are today? Right. I mean, I am, I am thankful, you know, um, of the path that I've taken today, but, um, I, I think the, the biggest thing is, is, uh, give, give me one second. Hey, can, I'll go back downstairs. Those are my two sons. That I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Where was I? Oh, I, I am actually thankful of all the mess ups and mistakes, um, that we've made. Um, yeah, you, you know what? Actually, I am thankful. You know, I don't know. There are some things I would do differently. And let's say if I do another business idea, yeah, I do carry the a lot of the uh, learning experiences and things like that from Alosha to these next um, learning experiences. But I really needed to learn those things firsthand with Alosha on the business side and even on the technical side from software engineering and architecture perspective. Um, you can read about these things in a book, but it's not until you really get into the ring and you get punched in the mouth do you understand why you don't do that, you know, yep. <laughs> you know, and it's, you know, it, it's a painful lesson, but it's, it's about the quickest way for you to learn. Um, and I tell that as anybody listening to this podcast, you know, you may have your reservations about being in the ring um, because yeah, you will get punched in the mouth, but it, it's just the fastest way to learn, you know. <laughs> It's the real world experience. I mean, a lot of these college kids, they come out and they're like not prepared in a way because they're so focused on, well, the book said it's going to be like this. No, that's not how life works these days. You have to get out there, learn, do as many internships. I always say I was a sports management major and you're reading definitions about marketing and stuff. And then I get out in the real world and I'm like, no, it doesn't match. But I'm better at adapting on the fly. So that helps, but I didn't learn adaptability in college. You kind of just get that experience when you're just out there. Yeah, that's that's deep. My wife was a um, sports manager major too. Yeah, yeah, so that's actually really cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, technically, I think with like your side, if I was, I have that business side, but I would be so interested in learning like app development because you never know if you start a business or you're working with a business and they don't have an app. You got to know about that side. And I think it's, I think it shows in your character that you're willing to learn about anything. You have that experience, that level in app development, but the way that you've been talking and how you're working with Mark, you're learning and wanting to know more. And I think that will make you even better when you get to those next projects that you're interested in. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, you know, let's, I don't know who said this, but I'll just say a wise man once said, you know, uh, once you stop learning, you're dead, you know, so you, you got to keep that, that yep. fire lit and that interest in, in pursuing knowledge and bettering yourself, you know, for, for the rest of your life. It's a, it's, it's like a, it's a soft skill that, you know, you just have to have as any type of professional, especially in the, um, in the business climate and in the software climate when things are just constantly changing, yep. new technologies are entering the floor, being replaced, oh, pretty much solid winners that were like perfectly fine two years ago are now just old technologies and no one wants to use them anymore and, and everything is um, it's fast, fast, fast. You, you have to keep on learning, yeah. So what does the future look like for you? What are you hoping to accomplish in the next few years personally and professionally? Um, so I, I guess uh, personally at, at this point, you know, we'll probably, I guess as a family, you know, I guess at that point, probably have three kids 
and you know it's about trying to focus a little bit more on the kids as they start getting older yeah. and everything start spending more time with them and everything like that because i've definitely been pouring in the hours on the business side and everything and it wasn't until really this year it you know uh, a lot of people will tell you uh, when you start going to the freelance business and everything, and a lot of the more seasoned vets, when you tell them that, you know, this is your first year, you can just see it in their face. Like, this is your first year, you know, because that's your first year is your heart. You know, you're going to have some hard times. Um, in my case, my first year got extended into my second year due to COVID-19. And so the business didn't turn a corner into until just this year, really a few months back, you know, um, to where I, I really became fully stable, able to have a nice comfy savings and everything like that, which is fine though. You know, we, me and my wife both knew the type of uh, chance we were rolling and the risks that were involved, but they're just now starting to kind of, uh, those, those seeds are just now starting to bear fruit, you know, mm -hmm. after all those experiences and all those losses and L's taken and everything. So going forward, you know, it's really at this point, personally, it's about like optimization, you know, spending less time on the business, trying to maximize how much income I can make off of the fewest hours I can do so I can dedicate it more to my family because, you know, my sons are growing up, I'm going to have another, you know, I'm gonna have a daughter here soon, and I'm going to want to be able to spend time with them because that was always the vision, you know, sometimes when you get to a, a, a middle, a place somewhere in the middle of your path, you know, and it feels comfortable. It feels cozy. That's kind of where I'm at right now. And it feels good. And I feel happy to be here because uh, there were times over these past two to three years where I didn't think I'd be here. But um, going forward, you know, I have to keep you know, pushing ahead or anybody really has to keep pushing ahead and remember what your original goal was those many, not many, you know, <laughs> some four, six, seven years ago about what you set out to do from Jump Street. Um, and that's what I intend to do. The final question I'll ask you for someone that's listening to this interview based on your journey and experience, what tips or advice would you give them to overcome obstacles, accomplish their goals and rise to the challenge? Okay. The, the biggest thing I can say is, um, you know, you, you're just going to have to, well, see me, I'm, you know, I'm a Muslim. So I, you know, I'm kind of a faith driven man, um, you know, you have to work on two relationships, you know, and in my case, it's my relationship with God and it's a relationship with myself. And, you know, when you undertake any type of grand endeavor that is beyond what, you know, the average person expects you to do, you're going to meet this, this force called resistance. And resistance will be there sitting on your shoulder telling you why you can't do it, um, you know, why it ain't going to work, you know, why don't you just, you know, stick with what you know and, and everything like that. Um, you're going to have to work on that relationship with, with God. You're going to have to work on that relationship with yourself and, 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 and make sure that you have those two individuals in your corner because there will be moments where you will be all alone and you will have to face that resistance, you know, that that inner dark self, you know, telling you to to go astray. And you, you're going to have to, you know, confront that dragon and slay it. Um, and, and that's the biggest thing, you know, is hone that self-confidence, hone that self-reliance and build upon those self skills. Because once you get those skills, once you get that self-confidence machine rolling, um, that momentum will carry you through some of your darkest hours. Yep. Absolutely. Well, Tariq, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about your rise to the challenge. We're excited to see what's next for you and excited to see what the future has for you. All right. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me on.